Next up is uh, Patrick Franken. Uh, he is a uh, lead software engineer with 12 year track record, best selling book author, and managing director of Eisler BV. As CTO at Eisler, he leads the software engineering team that ships electronic prototypes into more than 100 countries. He authored Adas Kaliap, uh, which is available to young talents in Germany that want to learn programming even at an early age. Welcome. Thank you. Well, I'm really thrilled uh, because when I started to use SkyCat, like, I think in 2010, I couldn't imagine there will be a conference at any time. <laughs> so now here we are. <laughs> Remember back then there wasn't even a release. So you just had to download some nightly build of SkyCat and then use whatever you have, which was a really strange time back then. Uh, but well, this is another topic. Today we will talk about how to get your prototype delivered. Because, well, I do not have to move so much. Um, what I noticed is there are a lot of presentations on how to engineer your prototype or your electronics. There are a lot of presentations and talks about how to assemble your prototype. But there is something in between. How to actually source everything. I'm talking about the printed circuit board here. I'm talking about a stencil maybe if you need it. I'm talking about the parts. And this is what will be covered today in my talk. So let's get kicking. Um, my name is Patrick. I'm the co-founder of the Eisler Group. Uh, back on the back bench is Felix, uh, the other co-founder. Please talk to him if you have any questions. Follow me on Twitter or add me on Instagram if you want to have um, pictures of me in the mirror. So that's what Instagram is usually used for. Um, enough um, about me. I would like to give you a rough disclaimer what this is about. So this talk is everything which came into my mind when thinking about, okay, how to get a prototype delivered. So I went through the whole process and thought, okay, this is something which might be interesting for you. So this is more beginner friendly and um, wrote everything down. So there's no story here with this talk. It's just a batch of hints, warnings, and advices. Um, so first of all, I would like to start off with why do we actually make a prototype? Um, once at a conference, someone talked to me and said, hey, we are, we are or I work at insert large enterprise company here, um, and we do not do any prototypes at all. And I was like, wow. So what do you do? Yeah, we go straight to production and run a small batch assembly. And later, like two hours talking with him, I figured they do prototypes, but they do this in small like building blocks and later in the process only assemble these building blocks to the, to the construction, whatever they do. Um, using this, this works out, not doing a prototype at all, but in the end you actually do a prototype at another stage. But this is different for us. We're hobbyists, we're small business, and I think um, if we get the process of building as in sourcing and um, soldering and doing all of that stuff right, it will save us time in the end and it's not a waste. Um, because when it comes to electronic, it's not like doing software. I, I'm a software engineer by profession, so I'm more from this side. I'm not an electrical engineer. And what I usually do with software is just compile, run, test, compile, test, run, like in 10 seconds all the time. That's just not possible with electronics. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in this because I think in the end it will save time. It gets us a better product because we can validate early with our customers or whoever is going to use this later. Um, and so as I said, when it comes to electronics, it's not just compiling and running. Um, so this talk is not for the next iPhone or whatever. I'm talking about what I call in-house prototypes. Something you do quickly, um, you sketch together and then you want to check something. It's like not for the compute board, but for the carrier board. We're talking about the simple stuff here. Um, so there might be a few drawbacks in this talk. We'll say, hey, no, this is just not possible like uh, he's uh, explaining it. 
Um, that might be the case when it comes to really complicated stuff. I'm talking about the simple stuff here. Um, so I would say let's spend some money on all the stuff because this is what we usually love to do. Um, all right. By the way, did you notice that the design of the slides changes from PCB with parts to just the PCB now? <laughs> it's something I, I still love my designer for. <laughs> Uh, all right, um, so when it comes to the printed circuit board, there is no fab which does everything. There are just too many quantities, specifications, different technologies, and delivery times. Because of this, I'm not able to give you any recommendation like sh you should go there or you should go there. Because it always depends on what you do. What quantity you need the PCB for the factories which are really good in prototypes but which underperform in large quantities and the opposite around applies too. Um, there are different specifications like sometimes you need simple PCBs which you can manufacture basically everything but sometimes you have really complicated stuff where you need advices from the factory itself. Um, when it comes to technology it's even more complicated like do you want a flex PCB? There are factories out there which are specialized in flex PCBs. So they give you not just the manufacturing, they can give you really helpful advices on how to make it better. Mm. So the obvious question when it comes to print circuit boards is always, what about China? Because most of, that's a rough estimate, I have no numbers on this, um, come from China. In my opinion, when it comes to large quantities, and I do not put a number on this, this always depends a bit, um, then China is great because they just have plenty of factories. So they can basically do everything in a short time in huge quantities. But this is different for small quantities and prototypes because of two reasons. First, for prototypes, you might want to talk to the factory directly. So if there is something went wrong, um, in China no one will answer your question. Um, and another reason is, for prototypes, I want to have it quick. And shipping from China takes time. This is obvious. So it's a different if the PCB ships from somewhere in the States or from China. And now you could argue, okay, but I charge, uh, I add the DHL express shipping or whatever. Yeah, you could do, but you pay for it. Um, I, on purpose, removed the prices down here because I hate comparing prices. So when it comes to the prototype, you might be fine with paying a few bucks more because you just don't care and you want it delivered. Uh, when it comes to series, this might be another story and you really have to cut prices. Uh, because of this, I do not make any price comparisons anymore. This is just a waste of discussion here. Um, but what I would like to talk to you is um, overproduction. So as you may know, PCB manufacturing is mostly a um, um, chemical process. And as always with chemical process, um, something goes wrong all the time because chemical levels might not fit. And because of this, PCB fabs, PCB houses, whatever you call them, usually produce a bit more than you request from them. So let's say you order 10 pieces and your design is really hard to manufacture, they will probably manufacture 20 of these to just make sure that in the end you get the right quantity made. So the other 10, if, if everything went wrong, the other 10 will probably go to the trash bin or you could request them. Um, but using this overproduction, they make sure that you always get the right quantity made. There's even software around um, from a Belgian company um, which is heavily used at PCB factories, which gives an estimate on how complex is this PCB. So you drop in the Gerber files into the software and the software says, hey, this is a complex PCB, please apply your overproduction factor of three. Um, in my opinion, this is a bad way to go because what happens if you decide to take a prototype to series is if the prototype is not well designed, and the fab does not tell you about this and just overproduce, they will, the fab will complain when they go to the series because 
like having a factor of two for 10 pieces makes them 20, but having a factor of two for 10,000 pieces makes it 20,000 and no factory will fabricate 20,000 to deliver you 10,000 in the end. So this will definitely fall back to you. Um, because of this, to, for the prototype, always go with electrical test PCBs and ask the fab, could you give me any advices on how to improve my PCB design? This is really beneficial in the later stage. Um, something about design rules, because people always say, hey, I followed the design rules, but my design doesn't work. I have short circuits or whatever. So, story is, if the design rule check passes, then the PCB might work. If the design rule check fails, it definitely, definitely does not work. So, always do the design rule check, but in the end, you have to manufacture the PCB at least once to see if it actually works. Um, let's talk shortly about Gerber files. So Gerber files, uh, as most of you probably know, is like the exchange format used in PCB production for, yeah, I would say it's even centuries. I do not know uh, the initial specification dates back to 1989 or something like this. Um, anyway, um, the file format itself uh, is great. It provides basically everything you need for PCB production, but the issue is that a Gerber file only represents one 2D layer of the PCB. So in the end, you mostly end up with having seven Gerber files. And now the issue is that all fab houses require different naming schemes. If they do not require a different naming scheme and just accept what you give them, then there's probably a person in the back um, who assigns different Gerber names to different layers all the time, all the day, all the months, for the whole life, which is a really boring task. Um, so how do we solve this? Best thing uh, I usually do, and what we also accept at Eisler, is just give us the KiCad file, because there's everything in it. Um, there are some concerns about doing this with Chinese factories, because a KiCad file is obviously a source file compared to the Gerber files, which are already pre-processed. Uh, my opinion on this is if China would like to reverse engineer your PCB, they will do anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so the talk is on record, but if you would take a picture of this presentation, this would be the slide, because if you are not sure which PCB specification you go with, and you just need some board to put some random parts on this. You never did this before. Uh, go with the FR4 base material, which is the standard fire resistance. This was FR stands for uh, base material used all over the world. There are still some fabs which offer like um, what I call rice cookies, uh, PCBs. So it's really a strange material. Um, Right here, no matter in Europe or in the US, you always get this FR4. Um, place the site for the Enix surface finish, which doesn't just look really nice, but it's better to solder than the uh, Hazel finish. Um, TG130 is a specification about how good the copper layer is, um, is staked to the base material. If you go lower than TG130, that might be the case, especially when it comes to a student soldering something that the, PC, uh, that the trays rip off. So always go with 130, 140, 150. Then you make sure that even after the 10 times soldering with hot temperature, the copper tray still sticks to the PCB. Um, and unpopular opinion here, but I would always stick to the classic green, because with the classic green, you always make sure to get it everywhere, because everyone provides classic green. Wow, just 10 minutes left. Okay, um, have to speed up a bit. So uh, what I see regularly is people putting notes on the Gerber files. Like we have a Gerber file which uh, has the outline of the PCB on, and next to the PCB is like a letter full of hints and please change this, please do this, please cut out something here, and could you please change this? 
no factory will ever read these notes, really. And I've seen uh, people writing down, please bring my children to kindergarten. So they, they put everything on the, on the drawings. The drawings are getting automatically processed, so no one will read this. It might even confuse the automatic uh, processing, so please not. Um, let's head over to the stencil. Design changed. Um, so stencil, for everyone who doesn't know about, is to put the solder paste on the PCB to later apply the parts to it. Um, way I really personally prefer this for SMD components because it looks exactly like done professional in a pick and place machine. So if you want to do a small quantity prototype run, um, just do it with a stencil and your customers won't notice that it's not uh, placed during SMD. Um, obviously, reflow oven is required, but I've seen people using pens, hot air guns, anything which is kinder above 220 degrees uh, Celsius. No, not sure how many Fahrenheit this is. Um, it's not as critical as everyone says. Um, I will probably remove this slide because I don't remember any EDA tool missing the paste layer. Um, Something when it comes to shrinking the SMD pads, so you usually shrink the paste pads a bit compared to the SMD pad. Uh, please don't do this because most fabs will shrink the pads on their side. So if you shrink for 20% and they shrink another time for 20%, probably there's not much left. Um, please, I can only encourage you to give a stencil a try because some fabs even give it to you for free and um, most of the time you spend less than 20 bucks for it. So uh, if you have some S&D parts on your print circuit board, give it a try. Uh, let's head over to the parts. Well, this is a paste today. Um, I think this is the most complicated thing because uh, there are a lot of things which can go wrong. Let's start off with a bill of materials. Don't make, mix up the bill of materials and pick and place list. This is something completely different. Pick and place list states where to put the parts, like X, Y, and rotation. Bill of materials says, what do I actually have to order to get the parts? Bill of materials is what you upload to DigiKey or whatever. They are not and should not be able to handle a pick and place list. How does a proper bill of materials for me look like? We have a designator, which is like R1, R2, sometimes named name. Um, anyway, you have a value, which could be 100K. Uh, you have a footprint, which always helps to identify which part goes where. You have a manufacturer and manufacturer part number, MPN. Please put both on the bill of materials because manufacturer part numbers are unambiguous between manufacturers. So there might be manufacturer part number 101 with two manufacturers. So put always both on. SKU is the stock keeping number for the distributor. Um, this really helps if you upload the bomb to let's say DigiKey, if you have um, DigiKey SKUs in there, they can automatically assign this. But, hint, um, please don't add SKUs and MPNs for resistors and capacitors, because with resistors and capacitors, we have a huge churn, like especially for capacitors. A capacitor you select today might be not available tomorrow. And this makes your bill of materials unusable. So if you document a bill of materials on, let's say, GitHub, GitHub chances that someone who wants to source this um, a month later uh, are pretty bad to get it uh, sourced. So what I would propose for, um, for resistors and capacitors, please put a specification in the bill of materials. Because with these specifications, um, no matter if it's you or an assembly factory, can decide at the point of ordering what to order. This is much better than the MPN, because if I notice, hey, MPN's not available anymore, I have to head over to the data sheet, see, okay, what does this MPN say? See, 100K, okay, let's look for another 100K, which is a total mess. Um, if you order SMD parts, no matter DigiGee, mouse, it doesn't matter, uh, go for the cut tape, because everything else 
is either really expensive, like the DigiReel, which is not required for manual pick and place, or you get 2,000 pieces. I've seen some bill of materials which have um, the, 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 S, the SKU for the DigiReel in, and then like 10 resistors cost like six bucks. And if you have a bill of materials with 200 pieces, you maybe not notice, and then you get a reel with 10 resistors on them. So that's a waste of money. Um, when it comes to DigiKey, this is a really nice trick. Um, DigiKey SKUs for cut tape always end with either 1ND or CTND. So if you look through the, uh, through the bill of materials with the DigiKey SKUs in this, and you only have these, then everything is good. If you see 6ND, that's a DigiReel, um, better change it over to this. Uh, for the quantity, what I usually do is um, I take the quantity I need, round it up, and take at least 10, because especially for resistors, capacitors, um, 10 are as cheap as um, five. DigiKey um, even gives you a hint if this is the case. Um, let's talk briefly about ordering parts in China. Um, you could do this, but please make sure that you, or that everyone else is also able to source the parts from what I call the top tier distributors. Because um, let's say you publish your project and you put it on GitHub and someone is maybe not able to get something from AliExpress or does not know how to order there, and then there's always a fallback to um, the top tier distributors. Pro tip up next, really nice feature of DigiKey, put a designator on the back. So um, when you have the um, shopping basket at DigiKey, there is an input box where you can put some text in it, random text. Um, it's really handy to put the design designators in there. So I put the order number and design designator in there. Uh, for small PCBs with only a few parts on this, like 20, 30 parts, um, you do not even need the drawing anymore. So you take the PCB with the silk screen printing on it, stating R1, A2, you take the bags, and then you can assemble it right away. This really works out great. Um, so now I would like to briefly um, introduce you to Eisler, because what we do is if you do not want to do what I just explained to you on your own, but you just need PCBs, parts, or stencil, you can go right to us and we deliver everything with you as a kid within seven business days. Um, until now, our service within the States, we are from Europe, was pretty bad. We got plenty of orders from the States already, but I honestly don't know why you should do this. Um, but I'm happy to announce that this will change on the 4th of May, where we officially open up uh, our US branch with domestic manufactured PCB, domestic manufactured stencils, and parts uh, proudly delivered by DigiKey. So you get all in one box. Um, and I guess there is one minute left, and uh, what I would like to show you is what I'm really um, proud on is, um, in my opinion, everyone who has a benefit from KiCad should give at least something back to KiCad. Um, like manufacturers, manufacturers earn money from, obviously from manufacturing, and these drawings have to be made somehow. And for a lot of us, this is the choice SkyCat. And because of this, we added to our shopping cart an option to make a SkyCat donation. So whenever you select, and you do not have to select it, it's always selected. Um, whenever you update, uh, upload the SkyCat drawing with us, we make this selection for you and round up the amount to the next dollar and add another one. And besides this, the donations which come in with this, we double this and add another 50% on top from our side. And I think if every factory, every, uh, every distributor would do this, uh, it would be really helpful for KiCad to get some funding on the development. 
because in the end we spend money on our prototypes anyway. So why not just add a few bucks um, and give it back to KiCad. So that's it. I would be happy if you have any questions. My name is Patrick. Um, you can also ask Felix. Uh, let me answer your questions. Thanks.